evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Jody Farhat, and I'm Chief of the Corps of Engineers, Missouri River Basin Water Management Office. My staff and I regulate the six dams on the Missouri River. We're very happy you can be here to join us tonight. Uh, this is the fourth in our series of spring public meetings. We do these meetings twice a year, as many of you know, and uh, use this opportunity to come around the basin in the spring and talk about the current hydrologic conditions and our, our planned operation of the reservoir system for the coming year. Um, tonight, we are also going to touch on the results of the independent review panel, which did a, a review of the operations of my office during the record flood event last year. Um, in their uh, report, they included some recommendations, so we'll talk about those. And then we'll also talk about the results of a study that we put out last Friday on what impact additional flood control storage would have had uh, last year on releases, and then what impact providing additional flood control storage would have on some of the other authorized purposes. So we're here tonight to listen to you also. Uh, so after our presentation, we'll uh, have a comment period, questions and answers. And we're here to listen to you and answer your questions, and we encourage you to participate. Um, so after my opening remarks, we're going to have a presentation from two of the senior hydrologic engineers in our office, and they will talk about the current conditions and the planned operation for the coming year. And then after that, we'll open it up for questions and answers. Um, we do ask that if you intend to make a statement, and you know that up front here, that you fill out one of our statement cards that were available at the back table. And when we get to the question and answer period, we call on the people who filled out a card first. Once we're through the cards, we'll open it up for other questions and answers. Um, we also ask that if you intend to read a prepared statement, if you could leave us, leave us a copy, um, that would be very good and we'll make sure that it gets into the meeting notes. Um, on the back table, there were some uh, handouts for you. I hope everyone picked up on the way in. Um, included was an agenda for tonight's meeting, a uh, copy of virtually all of the slides we're going to use tonight based on our previous three meetings this week. Um, turn it down a little bit. Yeah. Um, based on our previous three meetings this week, we had a recommendation for one additional slide on flood damages prevented. So that's in the slide presentation tonight, but it is not in the handout. Um, the other handouts there, there was a handout on uh, the restoration work that's been ongoing since last fall to repair the dams and the levees, um, and this is Omaha District's report. Kansas City District is also doing a lot of work along the river. And then there was another handout on assessing flood risk, so hope you picked up all of those on your way in. Um, one other thing that was available on the table is this small uh, piece of paper that um, has uh, our website information. Okay. Has our website information, and it also has instructions on how to get added onto our uh, email list. Um, at the last couple meeting, or at the last meeting last fall, or that set of meetings, uh, we had. They can't hear you. Oh, okay. Sorry. Um, <laughs> At the meeting last fall, uh, we had sheets for folks to fill out to um, get on our mailing list. We just had to write your email address. When we got back to the office, we realized we were very bad at deciphering other people's handwriting. So uh, now there's new instructions. You just go to our website, click the link that says add me to your email list, and you'll be on and you'll get all the information that we typically send out. So before I go any further, I want to introduce some of the Corps of Engineers staff here tonight. Um, beginning with the staff in my office, we have Kevin Grody, who's our Reservoir Regulation Team Leader, and Mike Swenson, our Power Production Team Leader. They'll be giving the presentation tonight. Uh, we have Doug Latka in the back, he's our Fisheries Biologist. Uh, Kevin Stom, one of our Senior Hydraulic Engineers. Um, Kathy Jensen was running, and Ann Pasipkas running our sign-in table in the back of the room. We have Lila Berry, who's the Northwestern Division Dam Safety Program Manager. And then from 
Omaha District, we have Colonel Bob Rook, commander of the Omaha District, Ted Strukas, there, the DPM, um, John Bertino, Chief of Engineering, Katie Shank, Chief of Operations, John Remus, Hydrologic Engineering, Joel Ames, our Tribal Liaison, uh, Monique Farmer, Public Affairs, Kim Thomas, Emergency Management, Kayla Eckerd Upmore, Chief of Planning, and Kevin Winger from Public Affairs. Did I miss anyone? Okay. Um, so I think that does it with the Corps of Engineers introductions. At this point, I'll ask if there's any elected officials in the room or the representatives that wish to be identified. I'm Donna Berry, with Senator Grassley's office in Council Bluffs. Okay. Scott Corey, Congressman C. King's office, Council Bluffs. Bill Irvin, the Senator Joe King's office in Nebraska. Bill Johansson, the Senator Nelson's office in Nebraska. Thank you all for being here tonight. Bill. Glad you were able to make it. Any tribal uh, representatives that wish to be identified? All right, so uh, I'm going to start off tonight and, and talk about um, the independent review panel recommendations and then also that storage study. So as many of you know, um, last year in December we put out, or we released a report that was put together by a panel of uh, independent scientists who examined the operation of the reservoir system during the 2011 flood event. These were all uh, professionals in their fields and included individuals from the NRCS, from the National Weather Service, from the USGS, and a professor from Colorado State University. So they examined our operations and looked at the data that we had available during the flood event last year and our decisions, our communication, all aspects of our operation. And we had a list of questions for them to answer. Um, the report is available on the website and they answered those questions and came up with a few of their own that are also included in the report. Um, but what we think one of the most important things are the six recommendations that the panel uh, came up with. So I want to just spend a couple minutes talking about those recommendations. Um, the first recommendation is not specifically related to water management, but really looking at this overall flood protection or flood risk reduction system that we have. And so their first recommendation was to support a program of infrastructure enhancement and maintenance to really ensure that this first line order of protection is always there and always ready uh, because they understand that in this time of reducing budgets and saving money that sometimes uh, there are things that don't get done that, that really should be done. So um, they, that was their first recommendation. Uh, some of these uh, things are being addressed in a report that we intend to release in late May called our Vulnerability Report. And in it we intend to look at the vulnerabilities in the reservoirs and the levee systems, the channel, um, in our water management operations and in, in our communications, all aspects of our operation for flood risk reduction. And um, so we'll talk about some of those uh, infrastructure enhancements that, um, that are out there that need to be examined in that report. Um, but the vulnerability report goes well beyond that as well. Um, the other five recommendations really are directed at my office at the Water Management Office. Um, they begin with updating the hydrologic studies that we use to manage the reservoir system. Um, as you can imagine, um, it's a very sophisticated system and we have many technical reports that we use to regulate the reservoir system as background information. And all of those reports need to be updated as a result of this flood event. Um, that we just need to bring that data in and re-examine uh, all those reports. So, that process is ongoing. We've got a couple of them uh, nearly done already. Um, we'll have the really important ones done by the time we do our annual operating plan in the fall and uh, finish the rest of them certainly by the end of the year. So that, that work is ongoing and we think that's really important. 
Um, the third recommendation is to review the system storage allocations. And the report that we released last Friday was the first step in looking at storage allocations. <clears throat> Admittedly, it was a, what we'd call a quick and dirty analysis. Uh, it was a very short time frame, start to finish. We did the report in about eight weeks. We used existing data and existing models. And we tried to look at what impact additional flood control storage would have both on the floods that or the flood that occurred last year in terms of how we could have added additional storage and brought releases down and then also what impact providing additional storage would have on those other seven authorized purposes that require water to be held in the reservoirs rather than empty space. So it was a quick analysis and I've got two more slides here that I'll go into more detail there. Um, number four was improved cooperation and collaboration with our other federal partners, the National Weather Service, USGS, um, the NRCS, um, and, and we do always coordinate with them and the states as well, but they saw a need to uh, increase the communication and this collaboration because one thing that uh, we heard after the flood is that a lot of people have data that they collect that isn't shared broadly. And so we should um, make sure that all the, the information and data that we have is shared uh, among agencies and look for those gaps of data that we have and see what we can't do to close those gaps if there's other uh, groups or agencies that have that sort of information. Um, and one of the gaps that they identified was uh, with their fifth recommendation is the information on the <clears throat> plain snowpack in particular. Um, they felt that our data collection uh, system for the plain snowpack, which actually there isn't a good data collection system for plain snowpack, but that that was lacking. And that we need also additional information on uh, soil moistures and frost depths and all the other things that play into how much runoff you get uh, out of a plain snowpack. And having this information wouldn't have changed the outcome of the flood. We can't control how much water comes off that plain snowpack, but it might have allowed us to have a better um, idea of how much we might get and then, you know, handle that um, earlier in the season prior to those very heavy rains, which were really the, the um, difficult, caused all the difficulties last year. And then the sixth recommendation was to implement uh, a more user-friendly uh, way of communicating both internally and externally with others and, and so we're working on these um, improving our web page and <coughs> some of our modeling better displays for some of our modeling results because uh, they are very technical and difficult to uh, to give to other agencies and also to um, share with the public it's um, you know we understand what that sheet of numbers says, but most other people uh, would be quite baffled. So. Next I'm going to talk about um, this uh, storage study that we put out last Friday. And we did have, <clears throat> uh, we posted on the web last Friday, uh, we had a conference call with the congressional delegation to discuss the results of that study. Um, then we posted it on the web and then we had a conference call with our media partners um, in order to be there to answer questions on that. And really the study was a two-step process. First what we did is we tried to determine what the effect of additional flood, flood control storage would have had on the 2011 flood event. And we did this in a bit of an iterative process. Um, what we did is we looked at how much additional flood control storage would we have needed last year in order to keep peak releases down at 140,000 CFS, 120,000, and 100,000 CFS. I need to pause here and introduce uh, General John McMahon, made at our meeting. Thank you, sir. Good afternoon, and I apologize for being late and look forward to your comments. Thank you. Thanks, Joey. Glad you can be here, sir. So, so the first part of this study looked at how much additional storage do we need to limit those peak releases to 140, 120, and 100,000 cubic feet per second? 
And, you know, the first question that will come out of most people's mouth is, well, why, why did you stop there? Why not limit the releases to something lower than that? You know, our previous record releases from Gavin's Point were 70,000 CFS. Give me an alternative where you can limit releases to 70,000 CFS. But the answer is we can't do that. The way this reservoir system is managed, flood control is managed on an annual basis. All of the water that comes in for, as a result of flood runoff is captured in the reservoir system and it all must be evacuated prior to the start of the next year. We don't carry water over from year to year in the flood control pool. That's how the system is designed and that's how we operate it. So if you look at last year's runoff, 61 million acre feet, which was 20% higher than our next highest runoff, if you just take that 61 million acre feet and divide it over 365 days of the year, we're looking at 85,300 CFS every day of the year, which is more than our previous peak release from Gavin's Point Dam. But we know that we can't release 83,000 out of Gavin's Point during the winter months because of all the ice issues that we would have. So if we substitute a more reasonable, although record release during the winter months of say 30,000 CFS, that puts us at the 100,000 CFS release for those other nine months. And we would have to run it from nine months. We wouldn't have the lower releases in the fall like we did last year. We would run 100,000 CFS until ice conditions developed. And so what that tells us is that um, we would have had, even with all the storage in the world, even if the reservoirs had been empty at the start of the flood, if we want to pass that 61 million acre feet through the reservoirs so that we would start the next year the same place where we started, we would have had record releases by at least almost a factor of one and a half, from 70,000 to 100,000 CFS. And that would have caused tremendous flooding. Um, the report talks about some of the impacts that occurred last year and at what release levels we were at when some of those things happened. And that's not to say that they would always happen at those release levels, but there are a couple examples in there. Um, one of them is the, re the effective release level when the levee at Hamburg broke was around 77,000 CFS. So had we had to go to 100,000 release and could have stopped there, we still would have had levee failures last year. We would have had um, the interstate at um, here in Council Bluffs closed when our release was around 100,000 CFS. So anything above that would have had those same impacts. So, you know, really the, the bottom line is that when you have the huge volume of water that you have to pass through, storage cannot be the total solution. Um, and then the second step of the analysis said, okay, if I take those volumes of storage that I need to limit those peak releases to 140, 120, and 100,000 CFS, what does that do to everything else over the long term? Not what it would have done just last year, but what would it do over the long term? And, and we did this analysis because we know that flood control is the only authorized purpose that requires empty space. So anytime we provide more empty space in the reservoirs, we're um, trading that benefit of the additional flood control storage with a reduction in benefits to those other seven authorized purposes. Um, so we, we used models that were used back in the master manual review, and we looked at five of the economic drivers. We looked at flood control, navigation, hydropower, water supply, and recreation. And what the study showed is that, as we expected, if you provide additional flood control storage, those other four purposes, uh, other than flood control, are diminished as a result. And we also looked um, at just the effect of 2011 on flood control, and certainly additional flood control storage when you have a catastrophic event like last year would have provided benefit, but it would not have solved the whole problem. So the, the basic conclusions of the report are that flood control would enhance flood risk reduction in a repeat of the 2011 flood event. 
but it would not have prevented the record releases that we, record releases, they, they could have been lowered, but we still were on track for record releases. Um, additional flood control storage would also have a very limited impact on our typical sort of flood operation, which is when we get heavy rains below the reservoir system and we reduce our releases out of the main stem reservoirs in order to help out downstream. And we did that just this <coughs> week, as many of you might have seen. Uh, we, after that heavy rain we had here in this area in south last weekend, we reduced our Gavin's Point releases to provide some flood risk reduction. That's our typical operation for flood risk reductions. But having additional storage in the reservoirs doesn't, in, in most cases, have any impact on that. Um, And then finally, I think is, is just the summary, is that flood control therefore is just one piece of the solution. And, and we intended this report to be a launching point for broader discussions. It's not a decision document. Um, we, we put it out there to answer some key questions, but we were hoping to start a dialogue with the folks in the basin about how we really do reduce flood risk in the basin. How do we ensure that if we did get a repeat of the 2011 flood event, that the impacts would be lessened. And that's going to involve looking at the channel and floodway conveyance, at the encroachments into the floodplain. Um, and, and individuals as well have a role in reducing their impacts. You know, if you choose to, to live or work in an area that's subject to flooding, then uh, there's a responsibility to purchase flood insurance and then to make sure that uh, you're capable of withstanding because we all know that in the end mother nature has the upper hand and we can't do enough just with the system of dams and levees to prevent flooding we just reduce the risk so that summarizes the <coughs> flood control storage report again it's out on the web and uh, we're happy to answer any questions at the end of the presentation on that but at this point i'm going to turn um, whoops Turn the presentation over to Kevin. Okay, thank you, Jody. Uh, most of you are familiar with the Missouri River Basin, uh, 529,000 square miles. Uh, here we have the Missouri River starting in Montana, Three Forks, Montana. And it snakes through Montana, North Dakota, South Dakota, Nebraska, Iowa, and finally through Missouri, where it meets the uh, Mississippi River at St. Louis. All told, it's 2,321 miles, and, and on there we have the Mainstream River system. Fort Peck in Montana, Garrison in North Dakota, and then Owahi, Big Bend, Fort Randall, and Gavin's Point. And here's a photo of all six of them. The mission of our office is to regulate the Missouri River main stem reservoir system to support the congressionally authorized purposes. There are eight authorized purposes. We have, in no particular order, flood control, hydropower, water supply, water quality control, recreation, navigation, fish and wildlife, which includes the threatened piping plover, the endangered least tern, and the endangered pallid sturgeon, and irrigation. Every time, every time we make a regulation decision at any one of the six reservoirs, we take into consideration all eight of these authorized purposes. This graphic depicts the, the overall storage in the uh, reservoirs. Uh, this depicts all the Corps of Engineers reservoirs in the lower 48 states. And, and you can see here Fort Peck, Garrison, and Oahe how much storage we have in those three reservoirs as compared to, to all the other Corps of Engineers reservoirs in the United States. By far the, the largest three uh, reservoirs uh, in the United States for the Corps of Engineers anyway. Uh, we often call these three the, the big three or the upper three. This graphic depicts if all six reservoirs were sort of rolled into one. They, we, we show this because we operate the system of reservoirs as a system. If, if we make a regulation decision at Gavin's Point, we're going to make a regulation decision at Fort Randall. We very well <coughs> make a regulation decision at, at Oahe and Big Bend also because 
When we, what we do at one project often affects what we have to do at the other projects. So we actually kind of roll them up as if they were one and we talk about them as, as a system. And in there we have four zones. We have the permanent pool, which is the minimum amount of storage we need to, to operate some of the authorized purpose, purposes, such as hydropower. And then we have the carryover and multiple use zone, which is the largest zone. And this zone here is, is to get us through a drought. Uh, and the last drought we, we went through, we actually met our historic minimum storage in 2007, 33.9 million acre feet. And then we have the annual flood control multiple use zone. And this is where we like to be all year long. We like to start up the runoff year right here at the base. We like to rise into that pool uh, during March and April. I need your Your Thank you. My battery's, my battery's going out. Um, but we like to start here. Uh, and as we go through March and April, when the plain snowpack is coming off, slowly rise into this pool, then we have May, June, and July when we get the precipitation and the melt from the mountain snowpack. And then the idea is the, the next seven months is that we slowly meter that water out until we end up right here again, right at the base. Uh, but sometimes, like last year, we get into this zone, that exclusive flood control zone. And if we're at Fort Peck and a garrison, we're up here in that surcharge zone. We don't like to be there. Uh, we don't even really like to be here, but that's where we were. We were at a maximum storage of 72.8 million acre feet on July 1st. Uh, this year, we were able to draw down to uh, 56.1, making 700,000 acre feet available. You know, as part of being a flexible and aggressive, something we heard last fall, try to make more flood control storage available going into 2012. And, and due to the warm and, and dry winter, we were able to do so. Uh, on April 1st of 2012, we were right here, just a bit above that uh, base of the flood control pool, which is about five million acre feet difference from where we were last year. This graphic uh, breaks out the, the big three, Fort Peck, Garrison, and Oahe, and then a sort of system storage. So this is of April 15th. I think your handout shows uh, April 11th or 12th. We updated this uh, yesterday. Uh, but Fort Peck, we are about a foot, 1.2 feet into the annual flood control multiple use zone. At Garrison, we're actually below that base, as we are at Oahe. And then system storage, we're, we're just below the base of it, as of middle of April. <coughs> this graphic depicts those top two storage zones, um, the, the annual flood control multiple use zone and then the exclusive flood control zone. Now, we always, we always talk about the big three or the upper three, but when it comes to flood control, then we add in Fort Randall, because Fort Randall has a significant amount of flood control storage in it. Uh, when it comes to flood control storage, Big Bend and Gavin's Point really don't play a part. Um, they, they have a very small amount of flood control storage, so we really just work on these four when it comes to flood control, because they have about 98% of all the flood control storage in the, in the system. So the runoff components, how the water comes into the, run, into the reservoir system. We have plain snowpack which, and rainfall, which occurs during March and April. And during those two months, we normally see about 25% of the total runoff. And then we have mountain snowpack and rainfall that's melting off during May, June, and July, and then the rainfall that's occurring during those three months. So in that three-month period, we normally get about 50% of the runoff. So in this five-month period of March, April, May, June, and July, we normally see about 75% of the total annual runoff into the system. And then during the remaining seven months of the year is where we get the other 25%. Now our forecast, which is updated every month, April 1st, uh, is 23.4 million acre feet, about 95% of normal. This graphic depicts that, that first component, the plain snowpack. So this is where we were March 1st of 2011. And the shades of blue here, the darker shades of blue, indicate the, the liquid content in that snow. So the darker the shade of blue, the more liquid content in that snow. And we can see here a year ago, the basin was covered with a, a, fair, a fair amount of snow. And we compare that to where we were, where we were on March 1st of this year. You can see this, it's in that 0 to 1 and some areas of 1 to 2 inches. 
significant difference from 2011 to 2012. And then the second component, the mountain snowpack. And again, here we are in 2012 with the blue. The red line is a 30-year average. The black line is where we were last year. And then we put in two more, 1997 and 2001, to sort of bracket what the maximum and the minimum have been over the last 20 years. And we can see where we're at right here above Fort Peck. And, and we only show these two because when it comes to mountain snowpack, the, the mountain snowpack melt only comes into two reservoirs, Fort Peck and to Garrison. So we can see here where, uh, and this again, this is updated April 15th, which I think your graphic shows April 11th. Um, we're about 92% of normal above Fort Peck, and we're about 80% of normal between Peck and Garrison. And it appears that both of those reaches have peaked, um, but things can change. They did change last year, but it does appear right now, if conditions stay warmer than normal, that they will have peaked. This graphic depicts the precipitation that has occurred over the last six months. So here we have what we call the fall antecedent conditions. So this is the precip that has occurred over October, November, and December. This is departure from normal. So the yellow indicates below normal. The green indicates above normal. And so you can see that during the fall, there's a, a fair mix of, of the above normal and the below normal. But as we get into January, February, and March, much more yellow and even browns as compared to the greens. So it was a very dry uh, early start of the year. And then this kind of indicates that with the drought monitor. Here we were last summer in July, pretty much normal conditions over the entire basin. But as we get into the fall, we're starting to see some drier conditions coming into the eastern sort of start, um, part of the basin, a little bit of Montana up here. And then as we get into the early part of the year, we see all of North Dakota, parts of South Dakota, parts of uh, Iowa and Nebraska starting to get even darker shades, which would be from abnormally dry to perhaps even moderate drought conditions. And then here we are uh, just in April, most of the Dakotas and then parts of uh, uh, Montana, Wyoming, and then uh, even here a little bit of Nebraska and Iowa. And then climate outlooks. Uh, when it comes to what the National Weather Service is forecasting as far as temperature and precipitation. This is for May, June, and July. Uh, this is updated actually tomorrow, uh, so we're working off something that was put together in the middle of March. When it comes to temperature, what they're forecasting for the Missouri River Basin is pretty much equal chances. And so when we say equal chances, there's an equal chance of below normal temperatures, an equal chance of normal temperatures, and an equal chance of above normal temperatures. So it pretty much means just about anything could happen. When it comes to precipitation, they, they do call for below normal probability or probability for below normal precipitation in the western portion of the basin during these three months periods. But for the most part, the, the most of the basin is in that equal chances. We show this graphic because it depicts over the entire period of record since 1898, the type of runoff that has occurred over the basin, uh, annual runoff above Sioux City. And what I'd like to point out here is the tremendous variability that we see in our basin. All the way here, started about 10 million acre feet to 2011 with 60 million acre, key, acre feet. Just a tremendous variability. And it switches very quickly from year to year. Now we do have periods where we have extended dry periods called droughts. And we also have periods where we have extended wet periods. When we take our forecast for 2012, the blue indicates what has already occurred in 2012. The red is what normally occurs, or the long-term record. And then that uh, yellow, or the gold, is our forecast. And we can see in January and February, we actually were, we saw above normal runoff. And that really was an indication of, not because it was so much precipitation, but it was so warm that whatever precipitation we got, we got in the form of rainfall rather than snow, which would melt off in March and April. And so now we can see that in March and April that we're getting below normal runoff um, because we, we had so little plain snowpack throughout the entire basin. And as we get into May, June, and July, we can see that we're forecasting below normal in, in all three of those months, which is indicative of what we're seeing with the plain snowpack and the precipitation forecasts. 
And as we move into August, September, October, November, we're, we're right now we're putting in about normal conditions there because the forecasts going that far out really don't indicate much more than equal chances. This slide we put in is not in your handout. Uh, we, we, this is the fourth of seven meetings and three out of three meetings we were asked, now tell us about damages prevented. So we thought, well, maybe we need to put this slide in. Um, we, we fully recognize that with this flood there were tremendous damages throughout the basin. But with the way that we were able to operate the system, with the emergency measures that we were able to put in throughout the entire basin, um, with the help of the tributary reservoirs throughout the basin, we, able, we were able to prevent a, a tremendous amount of damages in the system. Uh, in total, $8.2 billion in the Missouri River Basin was prevented uh, with the operation of, of these areas here. So we have, with the six main stem projects, $5.5 billion of damages, uh, tributary projects and uh, Bureau of Reclamation projects, about $200 million each, and then the, the levies, the urban levies, non-urban levies, the uh, local protection levies, and, and, and then the emergency levies that or the emergency measures that were put in throughout the, the basin all add up to $8.2 billion. And I'll turn this over to Mike. Okay, I'm going to continue the presentation by talking about the expected results for the authorized purposes uh, this year. Um, before we jump right to the project purposes, I'm going to talk a little bit more about our regu regulation forecast. Uh, Kevin discussed the runoff forecast earlier. That runoff forecast gets updated each month, and then we take that information and we put it into our reservoir uh, regulation forecast. Uh, this chart here shows the system storage based on that April 1st forecast. The black line over here is the actual system storage from last year. Uh, the blue line here is the based on the uh, runoff forecast that Kevin talked about earlier. That's one we typically call the basic forecast. Uh, we also run an upper uh, condition on that or a wetter condition, which we often call the upper basic <laughs> forecast. And then we also uh, run a drier condition on that, uh, which we often call the lower basic, that kind of brackets. Uh, what could happen or gives us some idea of what might happen. Uh, you can see on the blue line, which is that basic forecast, that we would begin uh, the runoff season in 2013 slightly below the base of the annual flood control pool. Uh, that's due to that uh, runoff forecast being slightly below normal right now. On this chart, you can also see the five system storage checks. We have the uh, March 1st and May 1st storage checks, which are for the uh, spring pulses from Gavin's Point Dam. Uh, we have the March 15th storage check, which sets the navigation service level for the beginning of the navigation season. Uh, we have the July 1st storage check, which sets the navigation season uh, service level for the last half of the season and also for the navigation season length, and then the September 1st uh, storage check which sets the Gavin's Point winter release level. Uh, similar sort of information in your packets for the upper three projects and I won't go into a lot of detail on these. Uh, they were more of more interest in the upper uh, meet, upper basin meetings. So then we'll talk uh, in more detail on the project purposes. Uh, start off with flood control. As Kevin mentioned earlier, we were able to draw a little bit of extra water out of the reservoirs uh, over the winter. Uh, storage got down as low as 56.1 million acre feet, which gave us an extra 700,000 acre feet of storage. Uh, and that storage is currently uh, still close to the base of the annual flood control zone. Um, and while the risk of snowmelt uh, driven flooding was low this year, uh, we have to keep in mind that rainfall driven flooding can still occur. Um, and we also want to note that it's still early. Last year we did get a significant amount of mountain snowpack the last half of April. Uh, we also had the tremendous rains in uh, May and June. And in 2010, which was a different type of flood event, 
event, we did have a significant rainfall in the lower part of the basin that's below the system uh, in May and June. So we have to continue to monitor conditions. It's a large basin. Uh, things can change quickly, and we just have to keep an eye on uh, things and make adjustments as necessary. Talk about another project purpose. Uh, this one's hydropower. This chart uh, shows uh, main stem hydropower generation since 1954. Uh, hydropower is largely driven by uh, releases, which of course is uh, uh, influenced by runoff. You can see how hydropower generation dipped during the last drought from 2000 to 2007. You can see how in the higher water years uh, hydropower was up. And you can see the recovery here over the last few years as uh, runoff has returned. Uh, in a big way. Uh, the blue line or the blue bar over here on the side is our forecast for uh, hydropower this year, which is 10 billion kilowatt hours, which is about what we would expect with uh, normal pool elevations and normal releases. Okay, navigation. Uh, we're past the March 15th uh, storage check that I talked about earlier. And we did, of course, have enough water and storage to start the season at full service flow support. Uh, the target locations of Sioux City, Omaha, Nebraska City, and Kansas City with the corresponding uh, flow values here. Uh, based on our current uh, forecast for the July 1st storage check, we do expect a full service support for uh, navigation for the basic and upper basic forecasts. Uh, however, if we follow that drier condition, that lower basic, uh, we do show a reduction in the navigation service level of 1600 CFS. In terms of the season length, we show full length uh, season for basic and the lower basic. Uh, if we would get that wetter condition, uh, we would have to have a 10 day extension to the navigation season uh, to uh, assist with storage evacuation. Talk about water supply, water quality, irrigation, and recreation. Uh, these uh, four project purposes are on the same slide, not to diminish their importance, but to uh, the common thread between these uh, project purposes is the access to the water. Uh, just in terms of um, reservoir elevations and releases, things will be pretty much uh, normal this year. However, we realize there are going to be some issues uh, out there in areas uh, following the 2011 flood. Uh, we have recreation areas uh, in some areas that are in need of repair. Uh, we could have some issues with water supply intakes and marinas. Uh, we've already heard at some of the upstream uh, meetings that they are having some issues with irrigation uh, equipment that needs to be moved around uh, due to changes in the river. Uh, so we realize that there's uh, been a lot of changes to the channel out there and there are going to be some issues for these project purposes. Uh, talk about uh, regulation for the fish and wildlife. Uh, going into the runoff season, we were uh, planning on having steady to rising reservoir levels at the upper three projects, that, that's Fort Peck, Garrison, and Oahe, during the forage fish spawn. Uh, due to the low runoff so far, we haven't been able to keep all three reservoirs rising. So as noted in the annual operating plan, we uh, are attempting to favor Fort Peck and Oahe uh, during the forage fish spawn. We're doing that by keeping Fort Peck's releases down somewhat uh, relative to other years. And uh, also to help out Oahe, we've increased uh, Garrison's flows uh, some. And also even things like uh, last uh, week's reductions in Gavin's Point releases for flood control uh, allowed us to back up some water uh, towards Fort Randall and Oahe. And then that last bullet is just uh, that we're going to continue to try to minimize uh, zero releases out of Fort Randall uh, during the turnip plover nesting season. Talk about the regulation uh, for the threatened and endangered species. Uh, first we'll talk about the piping plover and the least turn. Um, prior to last year's flood, uh, we would typically operate Gavin's Point in a steady release flow to target mode uh, during the turnip plover nesting season. And what the steady release flow to target is, is we would, uh, during the first part of the nesting season, which is typically about the early part of May, 
Uh, we would set a steady release that would allow us to meet navigation targets uh, for a portion of the navigation season. And then if uh, flows decline and we need to come up on releases, we would flow to target uh, to meet the navigation uh, criteria. Um, we're expecting that there's going to be some pretty good habitat out there for the birds this year. Um, that may allow us some uh, flexibility in our steady release flow to target operation. We may be able to do just the flow to target, or we may be able to start off with a lower steady release. Uh, but we'll evaluate those conditions uh, based on hydrologic conditions and habitat availability at the time. Uh, in past years, we've also uh, cycled Gavin's point releases. Uh, that um, is basically cycling is we do a one day up followed by two days down. The one day up is near that steady release level, uh, followed by two days down at some lower level. Uh, that operation is done uh, both for water conservation measures as well as a downstream flood control measure. Uh, we're going to continue to do intraday or hourly peaking patterns at Garrison and Fort Randall. That allows for uh, some hydropower peaking, but also allows uh, us to have consistent peak stages uh, downstream of those projects during the nesting season. And then we'll continue to do measures to minimize take. Those could include things like using the Kansas River reservoirs to meet navigation targets or possibly not meeting targets in some uh, locations of the river that don't have commercial traffic. Talk a little bit about the uh, bimodal spring pulse from Gavin's Point for the pallet sturgeon, which is part of the amended biological opinions, uh, reasonable and prudent alternative. Uh, due to the ongoing flood repairs and also the independent science uh, advisory panel uh, review, we will not be implementing either the March or May uh, pulses this year. Uh, however, we'll continue to work with the Fish and Wildlife Service on a path forward to ensure that we're meeting the intent of the BIOP and also complying with the Endangered Species Act. So in summary, uh, as Kevin discussed earlier, we have a slightly below normal uh, runoff forecast at the current time, but we do expect to meet all of the authorized purposes. Uh, Jody talked earlier about the, addressing the panel recommendations. We'll continue to work on those uh, throughout this year. And then uh, flood repair work is ongoing and uh, will continue this year.